the nine essential amino acids that humans need, the best place to get them are from other animals. Plants can make them, but they make them in the proportion that the plant needs. At least in the United States, we already have 70% of our diet comes from plant-based foods, and it's a pretty unhealthy diet. I think the current guidelines for protein are too low, and there's a lot of data that the protein for optimum health is more in the 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight. Average American, average individual in Europe are still at the very minimum of that range. So a lot of people now think about protein as you know 30 grams or more at three meals per day. And that's actually directly from my research. So I'm guilty of that. That first meal, when you come out of an overnight fast, appears to be really critical. But when you eat that first meal, it should be protein rich. The Olympic weightlifters are probably eating 250 grams of protein per day. I think that an average healthy adult should be thinking in the one, 100 to 130 range. If you are doing routine exercise and you're totally trained to do it, I don't think there's any particular window for protein after exercise. So whether you have it in the first 30 minutes or whether you have it at your next meal three and a half hours later, I think the net for the day is the same. And so people will say, well, I'm not an athlete, so I don't need as much protein. It's actually a U-shaped curve that the more sedentary you are, the higher your protein needs are. Hey there, welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. I'm Matthew. I'm here every week talking to experts on health, well-being and self-improvement. If you get any value at all from this series, please like, subscribe and share with other people who you think might enjoy these episodes too. Well, in today's episode, I'm joined by world-renowned expert in all things protein, Dr. Donald Lehman. We hear exactly how much protein you need to consume every day. Is it true you need to consume protein within 30 minutes of exercise? We learn why your breakfast should be the highest protein meal of the day. Can vegetarians and vegans easily obtain their protein requirements from their chosen foods? Is intermittent fasting detrimental to our muscles? Does weight loss on Ozempic mean loss of muscle mass as well as fat loss? We hear why diets often fail because they don't fix muscle metabolism. And should you take protein powder or branch chain amino acids? This was one of my favorite episodes so far. No matter who you are, whether you're in your 20s and lifting weights or you're a 70-year-old vegan, you are bound to get some value from this episode. I hope you enjoy. Well, let's talk protein at the outset and their building blocks, amino acids, because many people won't be aware of the fact that while we produce many of those amino acids, we don't produce all of them. There are essential amino acids that we must get exogenously, in other words, from our diet. So could we start by talking about that? We usually think of 20 naturally occurring amino acids that we have to have in the body. Of those 11, the body can make, and nine, the body can't make. So just like a vitamin or a mineral, we have to have pretty much a daily supply of those nine. Uh, and, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is where we get them. We're looking to have the nine essential amino acids that humans need. And so it turns out that the best place to get them are from other animals. Plants can make them. Uh, but they make them in the proportion that the plant needs for leaves and stems and flowers and seeds, which are pretty different than brains and hearts and livers and muscles. So, so we have to get these nine in, a, in the right proportions each day. Well, that's interesting because you're you're broaching a subject that I didn't want to get into quite yet. But now that you've you've mentioned it, yeah, I may as well delve a little bit deeper because it will trigger some people. Are you saying that we are inherently omnivorous and that we must ingest some proportion of our protein, our amino acids from a meat source? No, I wouldn't go quite that far. There's a lot of theories out there that human evolution occurred because we were able to have more what we would call nutrient-dense foods. You know, if we just eat uh, nothing but plant foods, they're fairly... Um, nutrient poor. Uh, so you have to eat higher amounts of calories, usually get it. So uh, 
people can do it. It takes a lot of food knowledge and a lot of food skill to do it. Uh, one of the statements I often like to tell people is, at least in the United States, we already have 70% of our diet comes from plant-based foods, and it's a pretty unhealthy diet. Uh, we're getting a lot of highly processed foods, a lot of processed fats, a lot of processed sugars, and a lot of processed grains. And so uh, it's not that it's impossible, but basically to do it well, to get adequate essential amino acids, most people are committing to fairly highly processed food sources. Uh, and there's a lot of people who you know, think that a, uh, a meal that has 25 chemicals in it to create a food might not be healthy in the long run versus something uh, like milk or eggs or meats that basically have no chemicals in them uh, other than what's natural. So the question is, how do you do it? And do people have the food knowledge and food skills to make it work? What would you say to those people, though, who would... Uh who would categorize themselves as uh, vegetarians or, or vegans and uh, who eat very cleanly as far as they're concerned, what would you say to those people who uh, would contest the fact that they can get all of their nutrients, their macronutrients and their amino acids uh, from the foods that they choose to uh, so very carefully select? They They can do that, but the question is, they're highly committed to doing it, and they're very knowledgeable. The average consumer can't do that. If you look worldwide, 80% of the plant-based protein, 80% of the protein coming from plants comes from wheat. Wheat is deficient in four essential amino acids. So if you look at use of beans and lentils and peas and seeds and and uh, soy products, things that we would all consider higher quality plant-based proteins, they make up less than 9% of the plant-based protein in the United States. So people aren't eating them. So the idea that someone can pull off a healthy diet is absolutely true. And the general population switch to it the evidence is highly, there's lots of data out there that the average person can't. And in fact, the more plant-based they become, the poorer the diet becomes. It takes a lot of food knowledge and a lot of food skill. Again, the average American doesn't have either of those to pull it off. And so the idea that that can be a general recommendation, it just is, it, it's, it's just full of unintended consequences. We know that the Food Guide Pyramid from the late 1980s, which was plant-based, it said, eat fewer animal products. We decreased the level of meats in the diet by 35%. Beef went down by 40%. Eggs went down by 35%. Dairy went down by 35%. People increased their level of grain consumption, and we got enormous uh, epidemics of obesity and diabetes. So again, we have evidence of what American public will interpret that to mean, uh, and it didn't work out well. The Food Guide Pyramid was dropped in 2010, uh, and, and we switched to my plate, which if you look at it, the front and center, the first most important thing is protein. Well, from one extreme, as far as diets are concerned, from the from the vegetarians and the vegans through to carnivore diets, I spoke with a proponent of the carnivore diet on this podcast only a couple of weeks ago. Could you talk to me about what your view of that diet is? I think that the human body is pretty amazing as a biological machine, and we can adapt to a lot of diets. So we know that there are people and cultures around the world that are almost exclusively vegetarian. And we know that there are cultures, Eskimos, tribes in Africa that are 100% uh, carnivore, uh, and both have existed for centuries. So we know it's possible. Uh, I think in modern society, I'm d definitely a person who believes in a more omnivore type diet. I like a diverse type of diet. I think plants are very important, but the, the concept is that what plants are important are vegetables and fruits. Uh, that's not what people are eating. <laughs> what people are eating are grains and processed cereals and things like that. 
if you look at the United States, our primary agricultural capability is to produce wheat, corn, and soybeans, which are not very healthy foods. Uh, we're not producing nuts. Our climate isn't going to produce avocados like Ireland. You know, you're not, you know, you don't have year round capability to do the broccoli and avocados and, and oranges and blueberries. Uh, you know, and so I think people need to come to grips with people in different climates evolve to eat different foods. And we can do that. But once you start making diet decisions, it makes other decisions for you things like physical activity and things like that. So I think that the current guidelines for protein are too low. Uh, I think the RDA is what it is intended to be, which is the minimum to prevent a deficiency. Uh, I don't think very many adults would say, what I'm really looking for is minimum health. What I'm really looking for is optimum health. And there's a lot of data that the protein for optimum health is more in the 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight. So average American, average individual in Europe are still at the very minimum of that range. Interesting. Can we dig a little bit deeper on that then? So exactly for a regular person who isn't too active, because it will be different, obviously, if somebody is into resistance training or they're doing a lot of sports, what does a regular person and how often should a regular person be consuming protein throughout the day? Because I've been told by other people that ideally you should be consuming protein with every meal. And and I'm actually guilty of creating that theory. So a lot of people now think about uh, protein as you know 30 grams or more at three meals per day. And that's actually directly from my research. So I'm guilty of that. What we know is that when you're young and growing, uh, your protein per day is the main issue. When you have it, doesn't seem to matter much. So a child who gets up and has a breakfast with eight or 10 grams of protein, has some more at lunch, has some at snack, has some at dinner, that seems to be fine. The distribution doesn't matter. What we know is when you stop growing and you get into your 40s and later, that first meal when you come out of an overnight fast appears to be really critical. So we think that first meal, and it, you know, people would translate that and say breakfast. Uh, I, I carefully use the word first meal. I don't necessarily care whether it happens at seven in the morning or eleven in the morning, but when you eat that first meal, it should be protein rich. Uh, we know from a lot of things, a lot of diabetes research, a lot of obesity research, that having the first meal of the day higher in protein and lower in carbohydrates is good for muscle health and also overall metabolism. In the United States, we tend to eat just the opposite. We tend to have carbohydrate-rich breakfast, low in protein, and we have dinners that are high in protein and lower in carbohydrates. So uh, in general, I think the research and certainly my feeling about it is that we need to switch that. We need a higher protein at breakfast. Uh, the, the data for the middle meal in the day is very vague. We don't really know a lot of people have translated our research into an even distribution through the day. Uh, I don't think that's as important as having a larger meal at the beginning and the end of the day. And by larger, I usually tell people we're looking at like 40 grams or more at the beginning and la the first and last meals. So throughout the course of the day, from the first meal of the day right through to the end of the day, Ballpark, are we talking maybe 100 grams, 150 grams of, of protein for you, your average person, your average adult? So so we've done a lot of research with um, overweight adults, sort of between 40 and 65. Uh, we find that metabolic stability uh, and muscle protection, you know, we get it at around 100 grams. If they go below 100 grams, we find they lose a lot of the protection. Uh, you'll see a lot of bigger individuals or bigger athletes going into the 150, 180, maybe even 200 uh, grams uh, per day. I think that's excessive. Uh, I'm not a big fan. I, you know, while I'm a protein person, I'm not a big fan of huge amounts. But again, you have to think about your goal. Is your goal to be a healthy adult or is your goal to win an Olympic 
metal in weightlifting. Uh, you know, those are two different in individuals, and and they probably are going to target different things. Uh, you know, the 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 Olympic weightlifters are probably eating 250 grams of protein per day. Uh, I think that an, an average healthy adult should be thinking in the one 100 to 130 range. For active people, people who are engaging in sports or or, or running or whatever it is, cycling, swimming, I, I believe ingesting protein after the session, there is a particular in, window during which is, it's advised to ingest some protein. Is this true? And if so, how much? Uh, and, and where is that window? Or if I, uh, have I read that incorrectly? Once again, I'm guilty for initiating <laughs> that research. So when we were studying the whole regulation of muscle protein synthesis, uh, this is getting a little more technical, we regulate it at two different levels. We re regulate at the gene level, which is called transcriptional, and we regulate it at the sort of molecular level, which is called translational. Uh, what we know during the overnight fast is we're down-regulating the body at the translational level, at that molecular level. So we wanted a way to study that. How could we make the body sort of like it was after a 12-hour overnight fast? How could we do it immediately? And we used exhaustive exercise. And so we looked at that, and then we gave protein right afterwards. And what we what we showed was that if you do exhaustive exercise, you'll down-regulate, you'll make muscle catabolic. It's breaking itself down. Uh, and it'll stay that well until, way until you eat protein. So we got the idea that we could give protein right after exercise and recover. That's got translated into the muscle world and all athletes now are t working out and taking. And what people need to recognize is this is only true in exhaustive exercise and untrained individuals. So if you are doing routine exercise uh, and you're totally trained to do it, I don't think there's any particular window for protein after exercise. So whether you have it in the first 30 minutes or whether you have it at your next meal three and a half hours later, I think the net for the day is the same. So people and trainers have overextended the research that was done in untrained, exhaustive exercise to what regular people, regular workouts would do, and that's not true. Wow, that's really interesting because I've seen some very big names online quote that you must consume X amount of protein within 30 minutes of lifting weights or whatever it is. So you're saying that's that, not the case. That's not true. That's an overextrapolation. That, again, it, it was done with untrained individuals doing exhaustive exercise. Again, we were the origins of starting that. If you do it uh, in trained individuals, basically the exercise that you do will give you um, a, a benefit for muscle protein synthesis for at least 24 hours afterwards. You basically become more efficient. Uh, one of the interesting things is that we sort of talk about protein for people who do exercise or athletes. And so people will say, well, I'm not an athlete, so I don't need as much protein. It's actually a U-shaped curve that the more sedentary you are, the higher your protein needs are. Now, as you begin to do some exercise, like going out and uh, doing fast walking or some running or some biking, doing some exercise, your protein needs actually go down because the exercise makes your muscle more efficient. And then as you become an extreme athlete where you're doing, you know, training 10 miles a day for doing marathons or something, now your protein goes back up again. So it's actually a U-shaped curve. The more sedentary you are, the more protein you need. If you're reasonably active, it actually makes your... So our comment earlier about vegetarians, if you're going to choose to be a vegetarian, then you darn well better be pretty physically active. And there's a reason that most vegetarians, certainly in the United States, fall between about 16 years of age and 40. Because once you get over 40, it's much harder to be a vegetarian. Now everything is working against you. You tend to be less physically active. You tend to have muscle that's uh, going into an aging metabolism. It's becoming less efficient. It's just harder to do it. You can't exist at minimum protein. Uh, you know, 0.8 grams per kg body weight doesn't work very well for a 60-year-old.
fasting. If you fast or if you engage in intermittent fasting, are you at risk of losing some muscle mass as a result? Fasting is something you really need to define the time. So intermittent fasting, um, one form of that is just time-restricted fasting. You know, we, we're talking about protein, but if somebody would ask me, what's the single most important thing to do in nutrition? I would say get calories correct. Being overweight, excess calories is the root of diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer. If you name it, it's due to calories. So the first thing is getting calories in check. And if eating two meals a day is a way for you to control your calories, I think that's a great choice. Condensing the time frame, uh, eating once at 11 and another time at 6, that's great. Intermittent fasting. I start hearing people say, well, I'm going to fast one day a week or I'm going to fast for 48 hours every two weeks or something. I think that is something a 25-year-old can do because we can recover but I think that's something that 60 year old should never do because to your basic point is once a 60 year old loses muscle mass and if you go into a fast, uh, you're becoming catabolic. You want to keep that fasting period as short as possible because if you actually lose muscle mass, you will never get it back. And so we think that's one of the problems of people who do repeated weight loss. If you lose weight by the wrong methods, you're always going to lose muscle mass. And maybe 50% of the weight loss, if you're fasting, can be muscle mass, and that's a permanent loss. So the more times you fast like that, the more muscle you lose, the fewer calories, the fewer metabolic regulations, the less mobility you have. So many things I want to ask you based on your answers here. Um, <laughs> muscle mass and muscle strength, is there a correlation? Because I've heard when it comes to muscle strength, the stronger you are, the longer you'll live too. Yeah, it, the relationship to mass and strength isn't very good. You know, you, you use the word correlation. Is there any correlation? Okay, some, but it's not as strong, it's not as good a correlation as you'd like. Uh, muscle mass... Uh, then you get into what is the composition of the muscle? Is it more red type that you'd get from aerobic type of activities, walking, running, uh, so it has more mitochondria? Or is it what we call more white muscles, with, which is what you get from weightlifting? Uh, the composition affects sort of the health outcomes. So uh, mass is something that we monitor uh, but people are beginning to show that strength is actually a better marker for muscle health than mass. And you gave a, a fascinating statistic elsewhere about uh, the incidence of falls and people suffering from uh, hip injuries, etc. I think something like a third of people in North America who go into hospital as a result of a fall and break a hip never come out. So could you talk to me, put that into context as far as, as maintaining muscle strength throughout lifetime is concerned? Yeah, we know that once you get to 40, you begin a downward trajectory as far as aging for both muscle and bone. And, you know, there's a lot of bone data that the healthier your bones are at when you reach 40, the better off you are, the less likely you're to have sarcopenia, I'm sorry, osteoporosis as you get older. Uh, we think that same tr is true of muscle, that the healthier your muscles are as a 40-year-old, uh, the better you'll age. Uh, as far as the issue of falls, uh, you know, people, people go to a great lengths to argue about nutrition and heart disease and all of that. But in the United States, the majority of people lived into their 60s uh, pretty healthy. I mean, you'll have acute heart attacks or you'll have some kind of disease or cancer, but, uh, and beyond 60, muscle mass determines a lot about your longevity and health. And falls are one of those things. In the United States, there's somewhat over 300,000 people who fall and break their hips per year. And about, and around one third of those never get out. So they simply don't have the muscle mass or the or the strength to ever recover from it. We know that being bedfast, that an adult can lose massive amounts of muscle 
uh, during uh, a very short time period. A um, colleague of mine, Doug Patton Jones, who d you know did some of the early meal distribution work and things like that with me, uh, he developed what he called the catabolic crisis model of aging. We always think about aging as kind of a, a linear projector, you know, sort of thinking, okay, it's a down. His view was that, no, it's actually a series of stair steps that as we go through adult life, you know, we'll get um, COVID, we'll get a fall, we'll injure our, we'll have a, you know, a twist an ankle. And there's a period of time where we become inactive. Uh, as adults, it's extremely hard to recover from those. We always end up on a lower trajectory. So again, the more muscle you have, the healthier it is, the stronger it is, both from nutrition and exercise, the better you are to withstand that. Uh, there's a lot of data that survival from cancer treatment is totally dependent on the muscle mass that you go into it with. Chemotherapy, your ability to withstand the therapy uh, is directly proportional to the muscle mass when you start. So I think that we've just become a lot more, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon and I have had a, have basically put out a lot of information about muscle-centric health. We think that if your muscles are healthy, your ability to live a long, healthy life greatly goes up. Fascinating. I spoke with a professor, Karen Esser. She's a physiologist at the University of Florida a few weeks ago on this very subject, and she was uh, talking about the benefits of resistance training uh, when it came to maximizing both uh, muscle mass and strength as you age. Uh, what are your views on resistance training? I think ideally that uh, people need a combination of both. I think that all adults need to do some form of resistance exercise, and that could be going to a gym. I kind of a gym rat. I like going to a gym and lifting weights. Uh, but yoga, Pilates, uh, even isometric things at home, doing push-ups, doing getting up and down out of a chair, walking stairs, anything that is resistance to your body weight uh, is critical. People need to do something consciously about that at least twice a week. Uh, aerobic exercise is good for the heart and the pulmonary system. So, you know, I think people should be looking at three, four, five times a week where they do something that stimulates their heart rate, whether that's swimming or biking or running if you can, uh, elliptical, whatever it is, you need to have something, just walking fast. But people need to recognize that just going out for a stroll has very little benefit. It burns some calories but it really doesn't do much for your muscles or your cardiovascular system. So people confuse, you know, going for a gentle walk uh, as, you know, time spent in exercise, and it's really minimal. But I still, one of my colleagues said, you know, said, well, what's the best exercise? And his response was, whatever exercise you'll do. So I think most people need to just start with the fact that in modern societies, we're pretty sedentary. So you need to start doing something. Ideally, it'll be a combination of resistance exercise and more aerobic exercise. But, you know, that's a pretty high bar for some people. But just getting up and stretching in the morning, uh, people forget. People think that for exercise, you know, lifting the concentric contraction, lifting a barbell, it's actually the eccentric. It's stretching out with the barbell that does the most. If you look at falls, for example, 90% of falls occur going down steps. It's the eccentric motion going down that we're not very strong at. It's not the concentric motion going up. And so, you know, people need to recognize how to do exercise too. And most people don't have the right knowledge of how to do it. So it's the lowering of the weight down rather than the lifting of the weight, which is the important part. Yeah. So a lot of people will lift a barbell and then drop it. They're missing more than 50% of the effect. You know, they actually should, you know, bring it up quick, but then lower it down slowly. This is so true. And you're talking about all of those annoying people in the gym that just drop the weight to the floor. Yeah. No, I know <laughs> not too well, as I'm sure many of the audience yeah. do. Can we... Can we talk about muscles and insulin resistance and its role in and muscles' role in diabetes? So 
Muscle is widely regarded as the primary user of carbohydrates in the diet. Uh, we need to step back a little bit and think about what we call obligatory glucose users, blood sugar users, the brain, the red blood cells, the nerve cells, the kidney. We need about 80 to 100 grams of glucose per day just to feed those cells. Some people will say, well, we don't actually need any carbohydrates in the diet because we can make that from protein, but we don't do that very efficiently. So in general, uh, we always say there's a carbohydrate requirement of around 100 grams. The actual RDA is 130. The, in the United States, the average adult's eating 300, three times the requirement. That's why we have obesity. People will call them out about obesity and fat, dietary fat or dietary. It's a carbohydrate problem. Where you know, if if your if your role in life is being a construction worker or digging ditches like back in the 1900 uh, era, uh, then you can eat a lot of starches. You can eat a lot of carbs, but that's not our lifestyle anymore. So basically, 100, 100 to 130 is kind of your target, and you go from there. Muscle then becomes the primary user of carbohydrate beyond the brain and nervous system. Muscle can use carbohydrates and exercise, for example, it ranges from about 40 to 70 grams per hour of exercise, depending on the intensity. So for some point, just going out and taking a walk, if you go out and do an hour's worth of walking, uh, you might increase your carbohydrate need by maybe 40 grams. So now you've gone from 100 to 140. Remember, Americans are eating 300. You still have 150 too many. Uh, so basically, Americans eating 300 grams of carbs per day, that would translate into someone doing three hours of intense exercise every day. Again, that's why we have obesity. So muscle is an important user of carbohydrates. If you're an elite athlete, uh, we clearly know carbohydrates are important for maximum function. Uh, the people running the 100 meters in, in Paris in the next week will do it exclusively on carbohydrate and ATP. Uh, they, a lot of the runners who run the 100 meters don't even breathe during the race. They run the whole race anaerobically. So it's all carbohydrates. For, for you and I, basically our primary fuel and the primary fuel in muscle should be fatty acids. As we're sitting here, our fuel should be 80% fatty acids and 20% carbs. I'm, I'm just fascinated. I don't think so many people realize just how important the role of uh, muscles are in, in, in metabolism in that regard. Can, can I throw out a quote, one of your own quotes at you, actually? I, I've, I got it on, on your website. <laughs> It reads, most popular diets can produce short-term weight loss, but ultimately fail because they don't address the root cause, which is your metabolism. And you go on to say that diets fail because they fail to fix your muscle metabolism. Could you go into a little bit of detail about this? So there's a lot of debate about, you know, what causes insulin resistance. Is it high-fat diets or is it high-carbohydrate diets? And you know, I've kind of studied both of those. I've kind of looked at that. Uh, and the reality is you can create experimental models to show both will do it. So I, I said a little while ago, the most important thing is getting calories right. So if you get calories right, then your proportions of carbs and fat make less difference. But if you're in a <clears throat> position of excess calories, then which is the body going to react which is going to produce the most negative metabolism. And people have always tried to make it fat, but the reality is it's carbohydrates. Carbohydrates uh, have their own disease. We call it diabetes. Fats don't have a disease because they're relatively passive in metabolism. We metabolism rel we metabolize them relatively slowly. We can store them. Carbohydrates, when you take in a meal that has excess carbohydrates, you, your body absolutely has to get rid of it in two hours, or in fact, that's the definition of diabetes. We do what what's called oral glucose tolerance tests. You take in 75 grams of carbohydrates, and if your metabolism's back, not back down to normal in two hours, that's the definition of, of diabetes. 
So we know that that carbohydrates in excess are toxic to the body. The body always has to get rid of them. And if you study skeletal muscle like we have, we can show that if you continuously give more carbohydrates than the muscle can use, meaning exercise, if you're taking in more carbs than you're burning with exercise, the muscle will, in fact, become insulin resistant because it can't handle any more carbohydrates. It's just toxic to the muscle. And so, you know, I think that's the basic root. And so what we want to do is we want to get protein higher in the morning because that stimulates the metabolism. It actually stimulates how your body burns fuels. We actually increase thermogenesis, term that you might or may not have heard of, diet-induced thermogenesis. Uh, carbohydrates, uh, we want to keep as low as possible because that keeps the insulin down and allows your body to use fat. So we want to correct that metabolism. And if you're going to eat more carbohydrates for, say, replenishing muscle glycogen stores, those should come in the end of the day before you go into your sleep period. Uh, um, and so we're trying to correct the metabolism. We're trying to correct muscle metabolism. So it's focused on uh, the protein it needs and also burning fat and keeping carbohydrates as low as possible. Can we talk about satiety? Because this is something that keeps coming up in respect of carbohydrates. For example, carbohydrates just don't satisfy us, so we continue to eat them. Whereas with protein or with fat, we seem to be satisfied quite quickly. What's happening in how the body is processing these such that carbohydrates don't satisfy us, yet protein and fats do? There's a lot of theories, and the reality is we don't have a super clear idea. I'll give you some of the pieces in a minute, but certainly one of those pieces now is GLP-1. I mean, GLP-1 now is a satiety hormone. So when you eat protein in particular, as the protein gets into your lower intestine, it releases satiety hormones, GLP-1 being one of those, PYY, ghrelin, uh, uh, and a couple of others, uh, they have very diverse effects, <clears throat> some of which are on the brain, which makes you more satisfied. So protein and fat, uh, let's start in the stomach. Protein and fat both leave the stomach slower than carbohydrates. So you, it's a little like fiber. You feel fuller. So just the mechanical aspect of satiety comes into play. You feel fuller where if you just eat carbohydrates or drink carbohydrate fluids, they get out of your stomach very quickly and you're perfectly happy eating more. Um, protein, and car protein and fat also, I, again, they produce a lot of hormones, gastric inhibitory proteins, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of these sort of slow down metabolism, make you feel fuller longer, make you feel satisfied. Uh, carbohydrates, on the other hand, are digested much faster, stimulate insulin, which then appears to drive glucose into the brain and it appears to make you hungrier. You just like that feeling. Uh, people have tried to sort those mechanisms out over the years, and I can't say we've got very clear answers to what the actual mechanism is. I just mentioned a lot of the parts. We know they all exist. Um, which one's most important? We still don't really know, but there's no question that fat and protein is more satiating than carbohydrates. And again, we would like to see that at the first meal. Uh, so work by Heather Lighty, colleague of mine in the U.S., uh, she's looked at younger people and that first meal. And, you know, what, what, how does it work? How does satiety work? Uh, we tend to be programmed to eat meals because it's meal time. So it says 12 o'clock, and so I'm going to eat. Uh, what she showed is that the satiety factor of protein, protein in particular, is that it reduces your desire for snacking. It makes you less interested in those carbohydrate hits, those carbohydrate chips or snacks or crackers or whatever. Um, so uh, it tends to reduce snacking, and I think that's a big part of uh slow weight gain over lifespan. You mentioned GLP-1. I may as well introduce the subject of the GLP-1 agonist, Ozempic. 
Uh, I, I know your thoughts on this already, but if you if you can clarify them for uh, the audience today, uh, the major downside, I believe, of the Ozempic is that you lose weight, but you also lose that all important muscle mass. Yeah, so it, clearly that's been popular, and <clears throat> my initial reaction to it was to be very negative. I've sort of moderated that. the The risk is how fast you lose weight. Uh, if you lose weight faster than, say, two pounds a week, it has to be coming from lean body mass. It has to be coming from muscle mass. And we think for adults, that's going to be a permanent loss. So if you're using a drug like Osempix and you're losing weight slowly and over six months, you're able to lose 20 or 30 pounds that you were trying to lose forever, that may be a good thing from a health standpoint. So, you know, I think there are health benefits to it. The other aspect, so the first aspect is how quickly and do you protect your muscle? Are you having a higher, I think almost all of the physicians that I'm hearing now are immediately recommending higher protein diets when you use it. Uh, I would recommend resistance training also if you're going to use it. Uh, so can you protect muscle mass? But then the other thing is, and with any kind of a diet approach, um, how long are you going to do it? Uh, is it a lifestyle change? I mean, if you simply take it for six months and go back to what you were doing before, you're going to go back to getting what you got before. <laughs> uh, and so the question is, is it something you're going to do for a lifetime? And some people are committing to that. Or are you learning a different diet and health approach, lifestyle approach while you're taking it? So that's my biggest concern as a nutrition health person is weight management is really a lifestyle. And you can do things in the short term. Any diet will work, as, as I said earlier. Any drug can work. Uh, but that's a short-term weight loss. What are you going to do after it? What's your what's your long term strategy? What's your end strategy? And that's what I'm not really seeing. How do you how do you deal with that? I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. The global protein supplement industry is said to be worth around thirty billion dollars. It'll rise to thirty two billion dollars apparently in twenty twenty seven. So it's big big business. Would love to hear your thoughts on the, the protein supplementation and if it's really necessary if you're getting your protein or if you're getting a balanced diet. Um, so the answer to the question is no, it's not necessary. Um, do I use them? Yes, I do. Uh, the issue is convenience. In fact, I have a website, Metabolic Transformation. I sell them. <laughs> uh, the, the issue is convenience and age and calories and all of that. So what we know, is, and I've said multiple times now, is your first goal is you have to control calories. Uh, and so if your easiest way to get 40 grams of protein at breakfast is to use a protein shake, uh, I think that's great. I recommended protein shakes to my elderly parents. My mother lived to 102, bless her, uh, and as she got older, I would say her daily calorie need was only like 1,200 calories a day. Uh, how do you get in anywhere near 90 to 100 grams of protein only eating? To so I introduced her to shakes. You know, I, I had her using our meal replacement shakes. Um, I think there is room for that, but I think it's part of a diet strategy. You know, if if you know your your morning is getting three kids ready to go out to work or you know go off to school and you're running out the door and you barely have time, you know should you have a protein shake or a donut? Uh, I think the protein shake's the better choice. Uh, you know, so I I think the issue is, uh, do we need them? Uh, the question is, are you getting your 100 to 120 grams with real food? Then you don't need them. Uh, I can easily get my 120 grams without using shakes, but I use shakes probably three, five days a week just because it's convenient. I like it. Um, so again, I think it's, 
what's your goal and how do you get to your target protein intake of 120 grams? Shakes are important. I think for vegans and vegetarians, they almost absolutely have to think about shakes. They just simply can't eat enough calories to get the essential amino acids they need without using shakes. Uh, I, I think that if you're deciding to be a vegan or certainly a, a, a fairly strict vegetarian, you should be considering shakes. Really glad I asked you that question because I've started consuming uh, protein shakes myself. Again, out of convenience, I, I, I already consume poultry and fish as it is, but uh, as I mentioned, it's just sometimes more convenient to ingest a, a protein shake. For people who do go down that supplementation path, what kind of of ingredients or in protein should they be looking towards? Because there's everything from pea protein to weight protein isolate and everything else in between. So what should people be looking for and what should people be avoiding? Because a lot of these protein powders have all sorts of additives and chemicals, et cetera, in them. Yeah. So, I mean, you used the word cleaner earlier. I think, I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, I'm a big fan of dairy. So I use a lot of whey protein shakes, which are uh, you know, the, the whey protein that I use is 97% clear, clean. So it has no lactose. It has nothing else. It has no fats, whatever. Um, if you look at most, a lot of the vegetable proteins, a lot of them can be as low as 60% pure. So then what else is in them? You know, pea proteins, I think, are typically uh, around 70 to 80% pure Um uh, so what else is there? Uh, chances are it's fiber. And if there's fiber there, that means the protein that there's not is bioavailable. Part of it's bound to fiber and so that a human body can digest it. So, uh, you know, you, you need to look at what the purity of it is. And then the next step is if you're going to use uh, a, a protein supplement, one of the things you're looking for is the level of the amino acid leucine in it. What my research showed and where the whole 30 grams of protein comes from is the uh, understanding that it requires a certain amount of the amino acid leucine to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. That is becomes increasingly important as you get beyond 40. Little less important. Leucine is important for a 25-year-old, but not as important. Uh, once you get beyond 40, it becomes critical, and we know we need it around three grams to stimulate protein synthesis. So when you look at your serving of pea protein, it says use one scoop. Then you need to know how much leucine's in that scoop, and you're going to find out it's around 1.8. So you need at least two scoops to make that work. Uh, with whey protein, you need about 20 grams with soy protein, you need about 33 grams of protein. With wheat protein, you need around 45 grams. With pea protein, you need around 35 or 6. So again, the serving size, you need to really think about as to how much leucine you're getting. And so uh, pea protein or soy protein can be perfectly fine, but it always takes more total protein and more total calories to be equal to something like whey protein. So, you know, people who want to use the vegetarian, and in fact, I sell a, a plant-based protein shake, uh, but you have to know how to do it. Uh, I have supplemented it with leucine to make it correct. Uh, so again, all of those things are things that if you're going to use supplements, you need to be a knowledgeable consumer because all proteins aren't equal. And then uh, just one final question then before I let you go. Uh, branch chain amino acids, you can find these in, in your local nutrition store. What are these and how are these different then from the protein uh, powder that we were talking about a minute ago? So, so as we said earlier, there are nine essential amino acids. Three of those are the branch chain amino acids. Leucine that I just mentioned, isoleucine and valine. Uh, it turns out that those three are very unique, and that's actually what most of my research has been. Uh, they're uniquely metabolized in muscle. They have a very specific muscle effect. Um, 
where all the other amino acids are metabolized in liver. Uh, so just make that distinction. Uh, as far as supplementing just the branch chain amino acids, what we showed was that you can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. You can trigger the mechanism with just leucine. But as soon as you trigger it, then you need all 20 amino acids to make it work. You know, without without the building blocks, you can't, you know, without the bricks, you can't build the wall. Okay. So as soon as leucine triggers protein synthesis, then you need all 20. And so should I take a leucine supplement? Well, probably not. You need all the protein. You need all of the amino acids. Uh, the branch chains are interesting is that when you trigger with leucine, you trigger protein synthesis, but you also trigger its oxidation at the same time. And when leucine is oxidized, it triggers the oxidation of the other two. And you'll see supplements out there of a two to one to one ratio because that's the ratio we showed they're oxidized. So once you trigger leucine oxidation, it metabolizes one of each of the other two. So you'll see supplements out there two to one to one. Uh, should people do that? Well, again, as soon as you trigger that whole mechanism, you need the other 17. So I think it's a waste of money. Uh, uh, I think that those supplements are a total waste of money with the one exception. If you're in a situation, for example, where you're really concerned about muscle loss, you're like doing weight loss, you're going to have a small lunch that only has 15 grams of protein in it. So you only have maybe 1.5 grams of leucine. Supplementing to get up to three is a big benefit. So we sometimes use leucine or branch chain amino acid supplements. And I frankly never supplement with just leucine. I always branch supplement with the three BCAs. Uh, I sometimes say that, you know, adding a supplement, if you have a really low protein diet can be beneficial. So once again, somebody who's uh, catabolic, somebody who, uh, an elderly person with a small lunch, somebody who's losing weight, maybe a vegetarian, uh, they could all perhaps gain from a BCA supplement. If you're an athlete eating 100, 200 grams of protein per day, the last thing you need is spending money on, on BCAAs. There's, there's a reason athletes are always joked about of having the most expensive urine in the world. If people want to find out more about you, where can they go online, doctor? Uh, I'm pretty visible online. I'm on social media at, uh, at Don Lehman. Uh, and also my website is metabolictransformation.com. And as I've mentioned, we actually sell some of the protein shakes there. So uh, both a plant form and a pure dairy form. So uh, they're meal replacements too. They're not protein shakes. So one of the problems with a protein shake is th then you're left to know what, what, what do I eat with it? So, you know, if I have my protein shake and then I have a big bagel, I've totally defeated the purpose. Uh, so we created a meal replacement, which stands alone. It's uh, it has protein. It has a low glycemic carbohydrate. It has fatty acids. It has f vitamins and minerals. It is a full balanced meal replacement. So that's that's totally unique in the market. And as ever, we'll pop a link in the show notes for this episode. Dr. Donald Lehman, really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. If you enjoyed it or have enjoyed any of the previous episodes, show your support, like, subscribe, and share with other people. Tell them about this podcast. Until next time, stay happy. 